On proper care and feeding of your psyche, how to flourish when the world is on fire. So um, this year, if you haven't noticed, is uh, uh, has been different than past years, um, and it's a uh, difficult in general to make it through a academically rigorous program like at Stanford, um, but it's especially difficult in this this year. Um, we're in the midst of an unprecedented, if you've not heard that word before, um, unprecedented uh, problem with the coronavirus um, outbreak that has affected 40 million people directly with over a million deaths worldwide and um, has affected the economy in new and astonishing ways. So this is the uh, unemployment claims in California um, also have been uh, absolutely unprecedented. Um, the use of the word unprecedented has become unprecedented. Um, so uh, what else? Uh, we're realizing and starting to appreciate some of the um, racial divides that have been present in our country for a long time. And some of that uh, frustration and anger is, is coming to the, the surface and we're uh, having to, to reckon with that. And um, there is uh, a lot of, uh, of, of uncertainty about the future of where we're going. And that's all not to mention um, things that are going on explicitly politically. Um, in short, 2020 is, um, is something of a dumpster fire. Um, and I use that word technically. Um, no, but like it's been, it's a, it's a rough year. It's a very rough year. There's, there's just a lot on everybody's um, plates and a lot of and everybody's psyche. Um, so what sorts of things, uh, how is this affecting people? This is the, um, these are the current numbers, the rates of um, mental health problems and depressive disorders uh, by age. And you'll see nearly 80% of people um, who are in the 18 to 24 category have had at least one adverse mental or behavioral health symptom. And uh, over 20% have seriously considered suicide in the past 30 days. Um, these numbers are astonishing. And uh, it's, it's, it's really, um, something that we haven't really seen before, uh, just such widespread um, pain and suffering. And so what do you do? What do we do? Um, what do we do as people? And what can we do specifically as Christians? And so that's how I'm going to break down my talk. Um, talk's going to start with focusing on what can, what do we all share? What do we all have in common um, as, as humans that are going through this pandemic uh, humans that are going through life in general. Um, how do we have good mental health uh, for that? And then what are some things that we can specifically do as Christians to have better mental health? So um, the way we're going to do it is uh, break down like what exactly is a psyche? How do we, what are the different aspects of it? And how do we take care of those different aspects? Um, so for those of you who are in the uh, philosophical realm, um, I'm going to um, there is a, uh, there's a, a breakdown that comes from uh, all the way back to Aristotle, um, but I like that one. There's plenty of other ways to, to slice and dice it, but uh, first thing is um, we all have bodies. Um, even before we start thinking about the higher things, we need to take care of our bodies. Um, in other words, you need to take care of yourself at least as well as you would take care of a houseplant. Um, that there are certain things that both you and your houseplant would need in order to do well. Uh, number two, you need to take your, care of yourself at least as well as your dog, if you have one, or cat. Um, that there are things that we share with uh, the, um, the rest of the animal kingdom that would be important for us to take care of and pay attention to. And last but not least, there's aspects which are unique to humans uh, that we need to uh, pay special attention to. So starting off on this one, nutrition, food, and light. So um, it's very easy. Um, the, uh, the coronavirus 15, I think I've heard, um, there's the freshman 15 and then there's the coronavirus 15. Um, and so, yes, uh, it's, it's when you're, you're quarantining, uh, something delicious and really bad for you is, is, um, likely, but, um, as we all know, healthy, healthy foods are good for us. Now we know that, but like, yeah, okay, maybe a little bit, maybe around the margins. But um, so if you, if you uh, look at, um, I, I often use depression as kind of a model illness or a model mental health. And by model, I mean, um, it's relatively well-defined. And so when you do experiments, trying to address it or treat it or whatever it is, we kind of know what we're getting. I assume this is going to generalize to other conditions and even to uh, prevention. So um, let's take a look at treating um, 
depression with um, with diet. So we rec we randomize people to a diet support group. What do we get? Substantial improvements in depression. Like uh, this is even more substantial improvements in depression than you get with a typical like antidepressant trial. Um, now this is not a trial that was head to head, but in terms of effect sizes, when you compare how effective something is, it's enormous. Um, eating healthy and specifically healthy here means um, this, this is, a, I believe this reference is to the um, uh, Mediterranean diet, uh, Mediterranean diet uh, study. There's also another study that shows a similar effect with um, the DASH diet, but um, lots of fruits and vegetables, minimal red meats, uh, focus on healthy fats. And uh, it, it, it goes a long way. It goes a very long way to helping you feel better. So we're gonna get to some life hacks here. So life hack number one, don't eat crap. Now, some of these you're gonna find are pretty obvious. And the great thing about good mental health is that many of the things that are good for your mental health, you know already, um, but is we're going to we're going to go over and emphasize. And remember, and if you just do the basics, you're gonna be feeling a lot better than you probably are. And so, yeah, there's some complex stuff we're gonna to get to at the end, but um, don't forget, don't neglect your body. Okay, number two, um, people who are feeling depressed often will say something like, I'm in a dark place. Um, and so some doctors said, hey, I know, why don't we shine a super bright light right in your face for like half an hour a day? And it's like, no, okay, no, that's doctor, that's not what I meant. I didn't mean that I was physically in a dark place. I don't need an extra light bulb. I'm like psychologically in a bad place. But it turns out this is an effective treatment that the Nobel Prize uh, for medicine in 2017 was on the circadian rhythm. And it turns out that 40% of the cells of your body know what time of day it is. They're regulated um, by circadian rhythms. Um, and that's astonishing. Like your esophagus knows what time it is. Why does your esophagus need to know that? But I don't know, um, but it does. And so, you know, this is also why you feel like death when you get jet lag. It's not just your brain that knows that you're, something's wrong in the world. Um, everything hurts. And so this is one of the reasons why. Um, and so if you give people bright light therapy, it also has an effect for treatment for, uh, for just good old fashioned depression. And uh, it's also a rather large effect. Now in California, we have this thing called the outdoors. And um, I know there are certain restrictions with COVID, but to the extent to which you're allowed to do this, go outside every now and then. Um, that even just a half hour a day is going to make, uh, can make a huge difference versus just being completely isolated in a room that has artificial lighting. So um, that's sort of the end of the, uh, the physical stuff. Like a uh, house plant needs food, uh, you need food. House plant needs light, you need light. Uh, now let's move on to a brain. Um, brains need social, especially mammals, um, social group community. They need to move, they need action. You need rest and sleep. Okay, so this is a study uh, like any good experiment. It starts with loads of cocaine. Um, so you get a bunch of uh, you get a bunch of uh, rats addicted to cocaine, and um, then that's how you start your experiment. Um, so the other the, the, the interesting thing here is that um, everybody knows you can you know if you give a rat free access to cocaine, it's just going to get addicted to the cocaine. But what this study found was that rats that are socially isolated are much more likely to use cocaine than the rats that are not. So if you look at this, um, this group over here that has both fun things to do as well as other rats, um, you have a dramatic drop in how much cocaine they use. But even before you give them access to that, you look at how much, how stressed they are. You look at the stress centers of their brain and you could see here in the, um, the isolated rat, there's huge amounts of these little speckles. Um, there's huge amounts of activity in the anxiety processing part of the brain. Just social isolation itself is anxiety provoking for social mammals, like for example, you. Just by giving a roommate to this person, and I know there's like restricted all sorts of things in COVID and this might be your story, but like restrictions are uh, just relaxing that a little bit reduces the anxiety substantially and, and giving you fun activities to do like in for rats like claim climbing up ladders and stuff that's apparently fun um, that also uh, substantially reduces anxiety so um, this is one of my favorite studies showing that this is important and so too with humans humans that are lonely have a 20% higher chance of dying in a given year. Uh, an astonishingly large effect of, you know, all the things that you, that you could do that are bad for you. Being lonely um, is one of them. And that is subjectively lonely, uh, not necessarily how many minutes you spend with other people. Uh, people have different needs for social time. Um, but it's, it's greater than zero. And so 
life hack, next life hack is spend time with people. Um, okay, now moving on to, I think the most adorable slide in my entire deck. This is my German Shepherd dog. You have to say dog at the end. Um, apparently the breed is called German Shepherd dog uh, to differentiate it from all the other kinds of German Shepherds, I guess, I don't know. So this is my German Shepherd dog. Um, he is happy when he goes for walks. If he doesn't go for walks, he is not as happy. Um, so too with humans. If you exercise, um, there's a substantial improvement in your mental health. And so this is a gigantic study um, in Lancet Psychiatry showing that um, there's a pretty significant reduction in mental health burden for people that do any amount of exercise, even just walking. Um, and popular sports are things like, um, you, know, uh, you know, soccer and things like that. Um, but overall, it's very helpful, people who exercise versus no exercise. So just even a bit of exercise. So, you know, again, limitations in COVID uh, notwithstanding, do what you can to at least be physically active a bit. Also, not that anybody cares about living longer or mental health, you do care about your academics. And so um, it does seem, this is uh, with uh, younger kids, um, it does seem that uh, for school-aged children, aerobic capacity and mathematic achievement uh, correlate rather strongly. Um, and so, it may be that your academic performance could improve with physical exercise. And last but not least, uh, death, uh, just absurdly large effect size here for low versus elite levels of fitness. Uh, so this is in quintiles. So if you look at the, um, just uh, when you have uh, low fitness, it's a huge risk to you. And even just going from below average to above average, substantial improvements in your, um, or, you know, reductions, if you could go in the other direction to your fitness. So to your, to your life expectancy. Um, and again, look at these effects. This is like the size of smoking or diabetes or, you know, I mean, coronary artery disease. Um, and this is something that you could change that's modifiable. So uh, next life hack is sometimes get off your butt. So next is, um, Okay, so when you're, when you're awake, your neurons fire, they produce waste products. Those waste products cannot filter out of the brain during the day. Um, there was a really cool paper that just came out a few years ago showing that these little channels open up at night and um, help drain that poison out of your brain when you sleep. Now, who's ever done this before? You're trying to go to sleep and then you look at your screen, you see all that blue light uh, you know, illuminating her face. Um, that's really bad for your sleep. Um, and they even had to come up with a new name for this behaviorally induced insufficient sleep syndrome. You don't have insomnia, but you you know check Facebook or Twitter or, or Insta or whatever the cool thing is these days that kids are doing. Like, don't do it. Like electronics before bed is terrible and staying up late is bad. So here's some basic sleep rules. Okay, get enough sleep, make it a priority. Like there's a lot of things you could be doing, but this is a very important thing for you to be doing. No, really make it a priority. Like seriously, you guys. Um, Wake up at the same time every morning. Consistency is baked into our cells at such a fundamental level um, that it's it's inescapable. Um, don't be in bed unless you're sleeping. Don't take naps. If you're not asleep in 20 minutes, get up and do something else. Um, Trying, you know, tossing and turning in your bed is not is not great. Um, don't have your phone in your room when you sleep. I know that this is like literally impossible for people under 30, but do your best. Uh, like get a physical alarm clock if you need to. Don't look at your phone before bed and no caffeine after one. You do these things and you will have a substantially better sleep regimen. So next life hack is let the literal poison drain from your brain by sleeping. Okay, so now that's all the, uh, that's all the physical stuff. I'm gonna start with a few secular tips um, to mental health. Um, this is my mentor, David Burns. Um, he says uh, something that is, uh, Sometimes surprising, but sometimes not. I think this is sort of the, the, the one-liner of, uh, of uh, one of the most important psychotherapies um, that's out there called cognitive behavioral therapy. You can learn to change the way you think about things. You can also change your basic values and beliefs. And when you do, you'll often experience profound and lasting changes in your mood, outlook, and productivity. So changing your thoughts, your thoughts have a critical influence over how you feel, how productive you are, your overall outlook. And these are things that are, um, are modifiable. And so um, this is what you often work through in um, psychotherapy. Um, or if you're not, um, if you're, your mental health is not to the point of needing a therapist on your own, with your friends, with your pastor, uh, whomever. Um, but the point is, the, the life hack here is 
tell the truth. Don't believe dumb things about yourself. So, you know, we got all these negative messages all the time. Um, like, ah, I'm not worthless. I, I'm totally worthless. Things aren't going to work out. Like, I'm not, I, I, I'm stupid. I'm not as smart as those people. I'm never going to get a good job. These things cycle in your brain and they're mostly not true. Um, they've got some aspect of falsehood or they're completely false. So it's important to identify what is false about them. Believe the truth. Um, and this is especially good. We're going to get into this later. Um, from a Christian perspective, there's things that are especially important for you to focus on. Um, but also, your soul doesn't just need to believe true things. It needs to do good things. Um, this is from uh, Viktor Frankl and uh, Friedrich Nietzsche. I don't usually quote Nietzsche approvingly, but uh, I do now. He who has a why to live can bear almost any how. Um, so this is a spectacular book. If you haven't read it, this is a, you know one of the most influential books of the 20th century, Man's Search for Meaning. Um, <laughs> This is uh, written from um, by Viktor Frankl, the guy on the right, um, with the less cool mustache. Um, and he has, uh, he focused on, he was a um, psychiatrist during the Holocaust. And by during the Holocaust, I mean, he was in the camps. Like he was a, a Jewish psychiatrist and um, described what it, what it meant for people to get through an experience like that and what it meant to, to survive and, and sometimes even flourish uh, in the midst of, you know, some of the worst circumstances that humans could create. And so too, biologically, the risk of death by purpose in life shows a substantial improvement in your, um, your longevity, your ability to survive. Um, that this is, this is a, a thing that is critical, like food. Um, you know, it's, it's poison to smoke a cigarette. It's poison to have a um, no purpose in your life. Life hack, do stuff that actually matters to you, at least sometimes. All right, so we're going to be shifting gears now and focusing on um, some things that are specifically Christian. Um, now, those of you who are at Stanford may recognize um, these, um, and these are uh, stained glass from Memorial Church. And this is sort of the uh, uh, three key scenes in the uh, life of Christ. Um, and so uh, this is, um, and, and each of these has, has, has kind of a foundation. Um, and then I'm going to be talking about there's the the and it, this is the, the depths that trying to uh, summarize is as a non theologian is um, is maybe foolhardy but I'm gonna I'm gonna do it anyways. Um, but the the, the incarnation um, this is a a doctrine that we start out with in in the, the life of Jesus that really gives value and purpose and significance to our bodies um, that that you know that. God took on flesh is a nice concept, but like, no, he like literally like pooped his diapers. Like he, he, he sweat, he bled, like th th how astonishing that is to allow, to, to believe that, that God values our, our physical embodied experience so much that he himself took on flesh. Um, it's an astonishing idea, um, but one that dignifies the body in a way that is impossible to to top. Um, but so too, um, this is, this is, so, you know, in a similar way, there, there's this, the, the crucifixion. And again, the ability to talk about what this means for the universe, that, that Jesus took on the sins of the world, that he bled and died for us, that he defeated the powers of darkness, that th there is this, this, this transformation in the history of the moral universe that occurs in the cross that is, that is uh, impossible to fully understand, but that it gives us a psychological grounding and a reality of our psychological world as Christians um, that, is, that is transformative. And finally, the, the ascension. Um, this is one of my favorite actual artistic depictions is the uh, Memorial Church stained glass. It's just absolutely astonishing. Um, and, and that this is a, a promise of what's coming, that we have hope in the future, that things are going to things are going to turn out okay in the very end, in the final analysis, and that we we know that as Christians, and we can have confidence in that um, because of what Jesus did. Um, okay, and so some of these some more specific doctrines here. Uh, number one is the freedom of the will. So there's um there's some key thinkers in um, the uh, the Western world here. Um, so uh, these these three dead white men are. Francis Crick, Karl Marx, and Sigmund Freud. Um, and each of them has a particular story about why 
you aren't free, why you don't have a, 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 the ability to freely choose. And so for Crick, I use him as an example of um, neural determinism or um, the idea that your brain determines who you are, that you don't really have free will because uh, it's just your neurons making you do what you did, um, or maybe your biology um, in a more broad sense. Um, Marx argues that this is uh, just a, that this is a, a class struggle, that everything is, is done because of the um, conflict of these various classes. And maybe also um, in a modern sense, we might say racial differences or um, racial determinants um, or social determinants of health is a common phrase. Um, and that this is another uh, narrative that might limit freedom. And then finally, um, Freud, the subconscious, that everything you do is or is heavily influenced by the subconscious, these uh, experiences that happened to you personally, um, how, you were, uh, how you were treated by your mother or how you grew up. Um, and that these subconscious, like the uh, uh, underwater iceberg, are the things that influence uh, uh, your day to day. And so this might be a picture of... Uh, um, a contemporary per person's view that there are biological influence of your decisions, that there's psychological influences um, and or personal influences, and then there's social influences. And some people might argue, look, um, the biology needs to be accounts for much more than we um, than we think. I just read a book um, by uh, Plowman, um, Blueprint, and he has a very good argument about why genes matter more than we ever thought they did. Um, and I think that uh, in contemporary conversations, um, the, the racial disparities and uh, the, the experience of race in America or race in the world um, matters, do, paints a person's whole future. Um, and so maybe this is the picture that we should, this is a more accurate um, determination of what things look like. But um, what nobody's saying, and what I think Christian must say, is that there's something else there's will. There's a part that really is you, that you get to make choices. Um, and whatever the distribution of the rest of that circle is, you actually have the ability to make free choices and determine certain parts of your life and your future. Um, this is from Genesis. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And so this is God giving humanity um, free will, the ability to choose life and death, um, the ability to, to have freedom in this really critical transformative area, um, and that this is the foundation. And of course, we have uh, moral choices all throughout scripture, and we have moral choices all throughout the day, um, but that we can't ultimately go to a picture that looks like this. There needs to be at least some of this, and maybe it's not gigantic, or maybe it is gigantic. How much, uh, you know, that's a good argument about how much free will we really have. Um, but that we have some of it. And what that means is that we've got choices. Um, and so, okay, so maybe we have these influences, genetic influences or biological influences. We've got personal history, things that happened to us in the past and we have social influences. And these affect our biology. Our brains are, are wired by say a childhood trauma or a particular combination of genes, a genetic predisposition, alcoholism or depression, um, or perhaps our race. Um, and the sort of uh, responses to society. I suppose I could expand this and say the sort of uh, physical uh, realities that are determined by our, um, our social background. And then that leads to certain thoughts, negative thoughts about maybe worthlessness um, or a bad future. And that leads to moods, that leads to our sadness or frustration. But the thing that is also true that is underappreciated is that we have lots of thoughts lots and lots and lots of thoughts, um, and that it's not determined which thought we hold on to. Um, and it might not even be that we can spontaneously generate thoughts, but we can certainly hold on to thoughts that come through our mind. And that if we hold on to the good or the true, um, what's, um, what's noble, those thoughts can lead to happiness or joy or resilience. And, and that's the thing that I think is, is, is underappreciated. And I think that, um, I believe that there's always at least something you can do to make your life at least a little bit less miserable. Um, and so I think this is something to keep in mind all the time, that I think that a Christian is committed to um, at least having this amount of um, freedom, and I think um, potentially a lot more. Now, let's move on to forgiveness. Um, forgiveness is another powerful doctrine in Christianity that allows us to, uh, to escape certain traps, 
So here's some philosophies that'll make you feel bad. Um, one is collectivism. Um, the idea that you are guilty for, um, for sins that uh, either your group committed or that were committed in the past, um, that you, they can't be forgiven, that can't be expunged, that uh, are on you personally um, or, or, or on your group collectively. Uh, perfectionism is another one. Um, you as a person are only as valuable as you can be perfect. That if you uh, get an A plus, uh, if you get 100% on your exam, then it's okay. If you get a A minus, that's not okay. You need to feel bad about yourself. Um, if you respond to all of the texts of all your friends, you're a good person. If you miss a text, you're a bad person. Um, or determinism. You've got certain traits and um, those traits traits are not changeable, that you're stuck with them and that you're, you, need, you need to feel bad about that. Maybe some people have certain traits and other people have different traits, but um, you're not going to be able to change because you're just determined to be the way you are and you can feel sad about that. But, but the good thing, the good news about Christianity is wherever the guilt is coming from, whatever philosophy tells you about whether it's your group or whether it's your personal failures or whether it's just the lot you were dealt, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That you can go to bed at night with a clean conscience, um, that you can be free of these burdens um, that others have to bear. Um, and this is something that, you're, that, that, that you have the chance to, to do. Now, this next one is huge and I think underappreciated. And this, this is a, uh, there's a bit of a personal story with this one for me. Um, when I was in uh, college, um, most of y'all's age, um, I was reading through Exodus and I realized um, I'm pretty good at following most of these, but um, I'm pretty good at not murdering people, at least in the literal sense. I'm pretty good at not literally committing adultery, but I work every day. I've got problem sets to do. I've got uh, nonprofit stuff. I, I'm, you know, I'm in a bunch of, uh, you know, volunteer groups. Like, I've got a lot of stuff to do. Like, I don't have time to take a full day off. Um, and then, like, you know, then the Ten Commandments were all like, no, yeah, that's like, that's a, you're breaking one of the Ten Commandments. Um, and it's pretty explicit too. Um, so there's the literal part of this, which is, you know, keeping the Sabbath holy and not working on it. Um, but then there's the sort of metaphorical one, um, which is, uh, are there other patterns of Sabbath? Are there, are there different types of ways that you rest? Um, this is a, uh, an article I, I read recently um, from NPR uh, from a Stanford med student about a year ago. Um, and so the, uh, Stanford, the term Stanford duck syndrome describes students struggling to survive the pressures of a competitive environment while presenting the image of relaxed California chill. Imagine a calm duck gliding across a fountain. Underwater, the duck's feet are paddling furiously against the terrifying possibility that it may sink, or even worse, be revealed as trying too hard. So um, I, I am, I'm, I'm no um, duck scientist, but I, I do think ducks float. But uh, nonetheless, uh, this is a common metaphor or common um, experience in Stanford, the Stanford duck syndrome. Um, and yeah, that's what we feel like we have to do. And like, you know, it's not just Stanford duck. It's like, uh, you know, I've got plenty of high octane Silicon Valley patients and everybody feels this way. You just got to keep driving. You got to keep moving. You can't slow down. Like it's, um, it's, it's exhausting. Um, but what does God tell us to do? What is the, what example does God set? And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. And this is also um, the foundation for the, um, you know, the, the commandment, uh, the Ten Commandments, to rest, and that we need to do no work in one day. And uh, so, as an, an, again, a personal testimony, I did that at the beginning of my, um, I realized this, was convicted my junior year, and stopped at that point, and um, was expecting my GPA to tank, because how could you possibly keep up? Um, but it went up, and I got into medical school. And after medical school, I kept it up. And even though everybody was still working and we had exams on Mondays, they're terrible, they're just really cruel. I would study up until Saturday night and then I would stop. Um, and I got through medical school. And then I said that that was gonna be the case in residency too. And some residency programs said, thanks, but no thanks. Uh, we don't want a resident that does that. And that was okay. And I didn't, I kept more or less true to it. And it was, it's amazing. It's the best thing ever. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Uh, doing this is so good for you, but it's hard. It's so hard to 
define your work, define your, your yourself, your value um, by something other than your work. It's so easy, especially as a, as a high performing student, as a, as a brilliant person to say, yes, I am important and valuable, not just because I'm smart, not just because I'm getting good grades, not just because my future is bright, but because God loves me even when I'm not working. And having that experience every week, it's like dropping the pack saying like, look, I don't, I'm not allowed. I'm instructed by the Lord of the universe to do no problem sets today is amazing. Like I can be free. It's like the first day of summer every week um, because you're not allowed to do work. Um, so it's a great commandment. I'd recommend uh, obedience. Um, but also this, this ties into something um, deeper too. Um, so this is, um, this is the new Colossus. This is the uh, poem at the foundation of the um, Statue of Liberty. And this is a great Norman Rockwell painting on the left. Keep ancient lands, your storied pomp, cries she with silent lips. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. So we think a lot about the golden door. Um, and okay, great. The, um, the American dream of the, uh, you know, white picket fence and the 2.5 children and the, you know, Norman Rockwellian painting here might not be what you're after, but it's pretty much the same thing that most people in Silicon Valley are after. Comfort, security, financial, you know, making it, uh, getting a good job that's nice and secure, having a, you know, uh, being respected and, and this, this sort of, this, this, um, material success doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be a billionaire, but you're going to be comfortable. And that's what everybody around you is telling you to do. Get the job that's going to get you, you know, on that trajectory. That's, that's good and comfortable. What does Jesus say? If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. So, Jesus doesn't promise that golden door, um, at least not in the same way that the American dream does. He promises us suffering. Um, and are we able to take that up? And that's this, this sort of bound up with Sabbath. Um, if you're trying to get that, you know, walk through that golden door, you got to earn it. You got to work. You got to strive. Um, and so this is something that's, that's critical. Um, but for Jesus, you could rest. You can rest in him. And that it's, it's the relationship, it's the love that makes the difference. All right, so next is community. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper uh, fit for him. So this is the institution of the family, um, of, of uh, the creation of, of Eve. Um, and so to the foundation of human community, uh, human relationships. And it's great to be doing the great work of uh, tending the garden and naming the animals, doing all the other things Adam was doing, but it was not enough. It wasn't adequate. It wasn't sufficient. He needed community. And so too, from the uh, question of, um, so in a spiritual sense, when the church is born, uh, immediately this is what happens. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. Um, they're together. They're, they're in community. They're eating together. They're praying together. They're um, praising God together um, and having favor with all the people. So Christian community um, is absolutely critical and transformative. And again, getting back to my own field, one of the things that changes your psyche, uh, apparently, or, or is at least connected to a changed psyche more than anything else that we know of, is this particular behavior of church attendance. Um, it seems to be the most um, uh, more than any other measured doctrine, more than any other measured thing. This particular, how often you go to church, explains so much. And obviously, it's not the, you know, the, the rote obedience, but all that goes with it um, is my, my suspicion. But um, on something that's, you know, near and dear to my heart, and I think a lot of people's, is, um, is suicide. How does this affect our willingness to be in the world despite the suffering, despite the pain, despite the misery? It's enormous. It's absolutely enormous. A five-fold reduction in the chance, the odds of somebody um, committing suicide. Um, this is a uh, effect size that is hard to find anywhere else in mental health. Um, so too with your physical health, 
life expectancy is connected to how often you go to church. Um, and this was a uh, one of the uh, landmark studies back in 1999, and uh, they've repeated the study over and over and over again, trying to, you know, I think uh, secular folks trying to find like, no, this can't be true, and it's like, nah, it seems to be holding up. And oh, we've adjusted for all these things, and maybe it's just that church people don't smoke as much. It's like, yeah, that's also true, but doesn't explain this effect. This effect is also enormous, um, but it speaks to something that that churches is satisfying a physical need, a need in our bodies that is, um, that is not satisfied elsewhere. Um, and last, the last section I'm going to talk about is, um, is hope. And this is something that, uh, a word that we, uh, we tend to not um, fully appreciate. And I think is, uh, especially in 2020, um, I think is losing popularity as, you know, I think in, in so many different domains, um, if you went back 10 years and said, what's the chance that we're gonna have AI uh, by 2020? I think some people um, would have predicted that, yeah, no, uh, we're gonna have sentient machines by 2020. You know, the, the curve is, is getting there. We're gonna have robot cars by 2020. We're gonna have, um, you know, everything is, you know, getting better and better at a faster and faster rate. We're probably gonna be uploaded by computers soon. Um, but um, we haven't really done that. Um, and so too, like um, the election of Barack Obama, racial unity is just around the corner. This is it. This is like, look, America's America's has made so much progress racially. And then the uh, protests over um, this last summer, um, I mean, were evidence that now, like, hey, maybe maybe we're not as we're not in such a good spot. Um, and you know, so too the the we thought we were. Uh, that that things are getting better from a, a healthcare perspective. That uh, you know that uh, medical advances continue, and that we're you know we've got information sharing abilities. Um, and then we get hit with COVID, and we're faced with our own mortality. Uh, many people for the first time. Um, and you know, so we have to we have to deal with these things, and these things are very difficult burdens um, that we have to go through. And um, being hopeful under these circumstances seems naive. But what Christians have is something different. It's not that we hope that 2021 is going to be better than 2020, because it may or may not be. Um, I know that's like not something that's uh, super optimistic right now, as we finally made it through, uh, you know, much of October um, to say. Um, but we don't know what next year is going to bring. But we do know the end of the story, and and that's something that can change everything else. Um, that knowing that this is a, this is a good story. This is not. This is a this is a comedy and not a tragedy. Um, this is a story that's going to have a good ending. Makes all of the suffering that we're experiencing right now have a different tone, um, have a different significance. Um, so here's uh, here's life extension. Uh, here's a few headlines I pulled at relative random. There's the uh, Peter Thiel's trying to find eternal life, Methuselah Foundation promoting longevity. Is the singularity near? Now it's 2045 is the new number. Um, and the Cryonics Institute, world's largest provider of whole body cryonics. Um, so yes, if you would like to freeze your body for the day that science is going to cure all your diseases. Um, this, is, this is what we're hoping in technology. And again, I'm a doctor, I love technology. I'm, I'm myself advancing the, you know, pushing the envelope and trying to treat, treat and resistant depression. I love this stuff, but we're all going to die. Like that's, I hate to break it to you. We're all going to die. Our physical bodies are going to go away. If we upload to a computer, that's also going to die. Even if it, even if the, the radical optimists in this area are right, the heat death is still going to occur. That this is, that, 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 that there is a finitude to the physical, this physical life we lead. But what does Jesus say? Or the Bible say about Jesus, Jesus says that he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore for, uh, for the former things have passed away. Our hope is not in technology. Um, that might be our profession. That might be our job. It is mine. Um, but that's not what our hope is in. Our hope is in Jesus and our hope is in death being actually overcome. Yes, we might get coronavirus. We might die from coronavirus. Not terribly likely uh, if, you're, if you're young, but yes, that's something that is possible. And so this is important for us to but separate that fear. We don't have to be afraid of death. We don't have to be afraid of um, anything because Jesus is going to redeem it. This is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. 
After this, I looked and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. The reason I love this passage so much is because even in heaven, from it's, it's still recognizable somehow to John in this vision, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, they're all there and they're all recognizably distinct, unified as one, worshiping Christ, worshiping before the Lamb. Um, so this, this apocalyptic vision in the midst of the, you know, the, the judgments and the bowls and the trumpets and the terror, there's this glimpse of, no, it's not always going to be that way. There's going to be this, this unity. This unity is coming, racial unity, uh, unity, uh, national unity. There's going to be this way for humans to come together in this way that had never been seen before um, and will be ultimately satisfying. Um, and uh, as a small example of this, but one that literally brought me to tears just this week was uh, 50 countries affected by COVID uh, singing Amazing Grace in their respective languages. Um, and so, uh, you know, look this up on YouTube. It's incredible. Um, and, and just seeing that, yes, we have this, we have this, this song written by a person who was the, was himself a, uh, a, a slave uh, he was the captain of a slave ship, and he repented and found Christ and wrote Amazing Grace. And you know that 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 person who himself was part of this racial problem um, of of literal slavery finds redemption, and that redemption is the is this thread that can connect people from all over the world in Christ. And this is just a small picture of what can happen, what's possible, um, and what is coming um, ultimately and truly when we're all before the throne. And finally, this, and I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. They will bring into the glory and the honor um, of the nations. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations. So a few things about these, um, about these verses. Um, this is, um, this is, and these are, these are pictures of uh, some just incredible human achievements. And many of you are destined to make more of these achievements, um, discover something, invent something, lead something, build something. That's coming, write something. Um, and that's not going to be wasted. In some sense, they will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations. That, that, that's, not, that's not for nothing, um, but that... That's not the main attraction. The main attraction is what's already done. The holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. It's God who's doing this. It's Jesus who's doing this. The work is complete in Jesus. Um, and the you know sin and death defeated on the cross, but then the place that Jesus is going to prepare a place. Um, and this is that place. That all of the striving and all of the work that humans can achieve um, is just a, a compliment um, is an extra, an extra thing that is going into the city, not the city itself. And I think that as, you know, citizens of Silicon Valley, um, this is something that is very difficult for us and very critical um, for you as you think about your future and you think about every day and the stress that you feel um, about like, you need to achieve, you need to aspire, you need to do something great. Yeah, I mean, sure, give it your best shot, but it's not your work that really matters in the end. It's, it's the work of Christ. And so you could relax. You don't have to continue the striving. Um, and that allows you to, to do this work more fully, um, do this work with less, uh, with less anxiety, with less stress, with less depression. Um, you don't do well in a class? That's okay. It wasn't that class or the trajectory that you now are on that was gonna make the difference uh, for the cosmos. Uh, the work's already done. Um, sins are already forgiven, death's already defeated. Um, and, you know, in the end, these things are ultimately going to be redeemed. Um, so these things, um, that this hope, you can, you can go through every day um, with this hope that things are going to be okay in the end and that you don't have to make them right. You don't have to fix them. They don't even have to be fixed in our lifetime. No, by all means, let's do everything we can to do it in our lifetime. Do what we can to make the world um, a little bit less miserable um, and to show what the kingdom of heaven really is. Um, but, but not expect that we're going to be finally successful here. 
um, because that is still coming. So with that, I will um, conclude my comments and say that is the care, uh, proper care and feeding of your psyche. Thank you for the wonderful talk, David. Um, we'll shift over to the Q&A now. Super encouraging to remember that we do have some free will in a fight against depression because depression can make us feel so completely powerless that how we share this with a friend. And we encourage and exhort loved ones to take uh, what steps they can for themselves without implying that they must pull themselves up by their, uh, their bootstraps, sparking guilt. Um, it's a spectacular, um, it's a spectacular uh, question. I think that's one of the most, um, the, the, the key questions in being a a caregiver for somebody who's depressed. And in fact, there is another Veritas form where we're going to be discussing that at length um, of how do, you, how do you be a good caregiver? Um, and the short answer is um, recognize, recognize, I think having a, a fully mature or sophisticated view of that freedom. Um, in depression, the amount of capacity a person has fluctuates pretty substantially, um, sometimes even day to day. Um, and so trying to, with the person and with the consent of the person and, and in conversation and in relationship with the per person, um, try to find things that you can encourage them to do. Um, and then things that they want to do. Um, and if they don't want to do anything, you don't have to like, you know, say you're a terrible person. It's like, you know, uh, be encouraging, be there with them, um, sit with them in the pain. That's, and that, it's always got to start with that too. Um, that I think oftentimes we want to jump to the conclusion where we say, ah, yes, and now we're getting you out of the house uh, three hours every day. Um, and, be, and the other thing is to be incredibly celebratory about the tiny, tiny, tiny steps that are just Herculean efforts for people who are depressed. Um, that like, just that I think I, I, it's very difficult for people without depression to recognize um, exactly how incredibly difficult some of these basic tasks can be and how much they should be celebrated. Um, another question is, mental health benefit, what, how do you score the mental health benefits of living for a purpose with biblical warnings against idolatry? For example, living for purposes other than God. And would you say that our society has more of a problem living without a purpose or living for wrong purposes? Oh, those are spectacular questions. Um, uh, I think that the, the um, there's this mindlessness of like this, this sort of default acceptance of purposes um, that I see with a lot of my, a lot of my patients that like, they don't really know why they're working so hard. Um, and so by default, I'll say, it looks like their life is about living for material comfort, trying to get enough money to have enough assets that retirement will be comfortable. But they wouldn't necessarily articulate that. So they have the worst of both worlds. They're living for a crappy purpose and they don't even get the, they don't even have the psychological benefit of no that that's what they're doing. Um, they have the uh, angst of saying, I don't even know what I'm living for. Um, so I think that you get the worst of both worlds. And um, I'd say that living for a purpose with the biblical worldview is that, um, that it's just like anything um, with, uh, it needs to be redeemed. And so this is, this is sort of, um, there's a lot of things that are okay if they're dedicated to God, if they really are dedicated to God. Um, and so it's, it's wonderful to say, you know, I am, I am, God has given me this, this burning passion to, you know, write the next great American novel or this, I just absolutely love my work in the, you know, in the chemistry lab. Um, and I, I want to, you know, really make a difference there. Um, that's fine. Um, and that, that, that can be turned to, um, to service of God. Um, but it's, you know, of course, as you all may know, uh, very easy to make that make that into an idol and say you're doing it for God, but really you're doing it for the fame or the, the satisfaction or even the, uh, the joy itself of the thing. Next question, ooh, uh, philosophical question. What do you think of substance dualism? If it were con confirmed, uh, what implications would you have um, for how you see yourselves and uh, possibly for mental health science? Um, it's a great, this is also uh, one of my favorite questions and um, I'd highly recommend the conversation from I think it was the uh, Veritas Forum at ASU a couple of years ago with me and Bill Newsom. Um, it's, it's, this is a critically important question. Um, I think that if you pin me down, I would say I'm a, a Thomistic dualist, which is a subset of um, substance dualism, but that these, the, the substances are kind of integrated in, in, in uh, not separable um, while on this side of the grave. Um, so in other words, um, 
but but uh, I think that this is a uh, I think the main thing is you're going to hear a lot as uh, a lot of people say that science has disproved dualism or whatever it is, and I can confidently say no, it has not. Um, and I think this is there's a the, that ASU talk is uh, goes into more detail on that. Just a lot of arrogance about where the, where the science is and the neuroscience, you know correlations in you know brain regions lighting up that does nothing to disprove the possible existence of a metaphysical soul um, so the other thing is that the <laughs> the bottom of determinism has, has fallen out uh in like 1920 with, with quantum mechanics and it's not like oh you know quantum mechanics so therefore my dog has a soul it's like no it's like quantum mechanics so you can't say with any kind of confidence that you know that things are determined when nothing is determined it's all statistical at the bottom so what are you talking about that you know that it's going to that's a that's a leap of faith so that's again very technical philosophical scientific conversation but um uh yeah i think that it's uh acceptable to believe in substance dualism um i don't know that um there's a way that we can separately interact with a soul um other than the things that we're already doing with like you know church and stuff like that so if it, if it turned out that um some kind of emergent materialism was the case. I'm not sure that that would be um, functionally separate. I think that, that, that we would, uh, as a psychiatrist, would behave any differently. I think it really comes down to emphasis. I tend to emphasize, like, look, I really do believe that church attendance changes things in some deep, profound way. Um, and I think a materialist would be less likely to say that. So, okay, so then the next question is common mental barriers that stop people from being able um, to Sabbath. I think the biggest one here is just, I mean, believe it or not, I, I, I mean, it's an old fashioned term, we just used it, but idolatry, I think that, I think idolatry of work, and, um, you know, to put it in more contemporary terms, having this, um, defining yourself, having your identity wrapped up with what you do, it's extremely difficult to, you know, not do that. Um, I mean, there's, there's parts of it which are just habitual, I work every Sunday, so why not this Sunday? Um, fear. Uh, I'm afraid that I'm not going to do, I, you know, I need this time uh, to do well. And, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll soon realize that you wasted a lot of time before and now you're not gonna. Um, and so your um, the Sabbath sort of forces, forces that. So to a sleep, um, you prioritize eight hours of sleep a night, you get, you get everything else done. If that becomes an ironclad rule, you get your stuff done. Um, and if you can't fit it in and sleep eight hours, then don't do it. Like you've got, you've got limits and, um, you know, that this is a, I think that even in college, it's reasonable to, um, you know, to, to make limits. Um, so, uh, I think the question is, what would you say about guilt and forgiveness, uh, the role of guilt and forgiveness in shaping an individual psyche? Um, how is this changing as society continues to be, um, to head in the direction of denying objective morality? And a need for guilt, and uh, how would you respond to those who argue that religious guilt and moral claims are the real problem? Um, answering that last one first, I'd say that, I mean, from a, every measure, that's false. Um, that okay, that certainly there are stories of people that religious guilt is a huge, huge problem. But you know, guilt isn't like a uniquely religious person problem. Um, and we like to joke, ah, ha, ha, Catholic guilt, or I had, you know, you know, that was like, Chris, it's like, no, like, trust me, I take, I see a lot of people that are atheists and they're very guilty, except they just have no metaphysical escape for it. And I think that we can like from a, you know, from even a rational standpoint, use, you know, this is cognitive therapy, say like, well, you know, the things you're getting accused of aren't even rational. Um, aren't even like with aren't even within your own worldview. Should you be feeling guilty about those things? And so we can help people out to some extent there. Uh, but I don't think that the um, that uh, religious people are especially guilty is um, substantiated in the data. Um, I mean, so too with the suicide thing. Um, like that's 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 pretty uh, pretty big differences in the uh, other direction. As society continues to head in the direction of denying objective morality and need for guilt. Um, this is also interesting. I, I, I think in the last one year, we've done a 180 on this. Um, I, I think that the, um, the, you know, this idea that you should be guilty um, and that there, are, there is an objective right and wrong, it's just a different set of values. Um, so I think that often things people would say you should feel guilty about um, now are, I mean, 
there's no lack of moral approbation regarding social distancing and masks, for example, or um, how people speak about others. Uh, so speech codes have become incredibly important, um, how one refers to others uh, in the, you know, even the, uh, and in the secular dialogue, um, and maybe Christian dialogue too. Um, but it's interesting, right? Because like on what foundation, like what is the metaphysical foundation for, you know, you, you shouldn't say these things or, you know, um, that, uh, you know, racist speech is wrong. Um, on what grounds can we claim that? I think that there's, there's a, a very significant lack of philosophical foundations um, apart from um, some sort of Christian worldview. Um, and now it seems like we're even going away from a enlightenment worldview, which again, it just seems to be, uh, very unstable. So I, I would predict, uh, so this is like a, you know, I don't know, much longer conversation about where, uh, you know, ethics is going. But um, to get that last question first, what role would you say guilt and forgiveness play in shaping an individual psyche? I think guilt can, can completely define a person. And especially with, um, uh, especially in mental, uh, mental health, um, like depression and um, other mental illnesses, like, it really becomes overwhelming and um, and irrational in ways that are um, that are kind of astonishing. Um, so it's it's the the it sometimes and it's one of the the sort of senses that kind of runs out of control. It's it's like the uh, the gas is stuck in the uh, stuck to the floor or the um, you know it's 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 spinning out of control of the part of your brain that controls guilt. And it's just accusing you of all sorts of things. And it's like, sometimes it gets completely irrational. And I think that, um, again, there's, there's treatments and medications. Um, and as much as I uh, ragged on medications in this talk, uh, medications are great if you have major depression. Um, that's, a, that's a spectacular treatment. But those things help calm those irrational fears down. Um, but for people without mental health um, concerns, um, guilt can also rack you and just torture you. Um, and I think that Christianity has a pathway out and it is it is forgiveness. It's receiving forgiveness. It's uh, it's giving forgiveness. That uh, you know, that's the other thing of, of perpetually conflicting relationships. If you're continually in conflict with other people, um, that's also something that is um, and that forgiveness can help overcome. Next question here is: um, As the data you shared from quite a few years ago as concerns suicidality decreasing due to devout faith, frequency of involvement been repeated and consistent over the years. Um, yeah, yeah, no. So uh, both of those studies, um, the uh, the faith and suicide, and then the, the, I'm sorry, religious service attendance and suicide, and religious service attendance and um, uh, mortality, that 1999 paper was repeated and repeated and repeated. Um, I read a meta-analysis recently. And it said, um, we no longer need to evaluate whether or not there is an effect. Um, so stop trying to like disprove this. Every <laughs> day. We don't, that's not the question anymore. It's how is this working? And again, as a you know Christian and a scientist, it's it's very interesting to me. I don't I don't I don't know the pathway by which a person attending church is not going to have a heart attack. Like I don't know how that happens. Is it a supernatural thing? Is it um, you know a, a psychological thing? And how's it you know does that reduce the cortisol? Like what's the what are the there's all sorts of questions to be uh, to be answered. But um, yeah, no, the, 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 the data is quite robust and continues to be um, hold up to, uh, to repeated, repeated uh, challenge. Okay, next question is, how can we as parents or as the church raise children who are more resilient against depression and anxiety, especially if there's a family history? Um, also a great question. And, and I think that, um, I think that the, the, there's a variety of answers, but I think that, um, it's it's healthy living in some in a lot of these same ways, um, healthy philosophies um, and healthy um, living a, a a robust and well balanced life is I think the the best stay or prevention of depression, and I think that the um, you know we talk about like well-balanced and you need a, a well-balanced, uh, you know, resume or list of extracurricular activities to get into college. And I don't really mean that, um, though that, you know, that, 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 I think that probably this, this, like this, this intense, like 
competitive universe that is almost impossible to escape is, um, is I think a big driver. Um, and also that like you are your, this, this ubiquitous universe that we all live in of you are your, your worth, you are your resume, there is nothing else. Um, I think that philosophy is hugely damaging. Um, but again, like there's, there's some really basic things too. Like, you know, I can't tell you how many of my, um, you know, teenage patients are like just not getting enough sleep and it's not, they have insomnia so they're checking their phone or whatever stupid thing. And it's like, yeah, I know, I get it. Like we want to have our phones and like they're useful, but like that is an, in, I didn't talk about this, but not getting enough sleep voluntarily is an independent risk factor for suicide. So like there's just, so there's some basic things and then there's some more challenging, like how do we change our society things? And then, okay, how do we change our own family? Like, are there things that we're doing personally um, to communicate? You know, what really matters is your work, your value that comes from your work. Um, and so, you know, but again, it's really difficult as an individual. Um, and this is also why we need community. Um, like if we had a group of people, like if all of your friends um, at youth group or all of your friends in, you know, uh, uh, you know, Veritas Forum Planning Committee or from, um, you know, Christian Union or, or uh, InterVarsity or whatever group you're a part of, if everybody there was like, look, I got a bad grade, but it doesn't affect me at all um, because, you know, we as a community have decided the things that matter are spiritual. That's incredibly helpful to be able to, um, to teach ourselves that the ways of the world are not the ways. Um, so, this is, um, and the family history thing, I wouldn't worry. No, I mean, yeah, we're, <laughs> worry about it as much as you need to. Um, but like depression is, um, is heritable, but it's not overwhelmingly heritable. Um, it's on the lower end of psychologically heritable traits. Um, but also appreciate the good sides of um, some of those traits that it, it's like, there's a difference between depression and um, uh, emotional sensitivity. Uh, or emotional stability, being able to recognize the tragedy in life and being able to, you know, write or think or, or notice um, when things hurt, that's not bad and appreciating the people for those, uh, for those things um, and appreciating children who have those uh, qualities uh, is good. Uh, for Christians, should the purpose of self-care be different? How can I be motivated to eat healthy, exercise, etc., without making it about myself? for my happiness, which feels like a self-centered motivation rather than a God-centered motivation? Um, also a good question. I think that this is because, yeah, everything can be an idol. And this is like the, this is like the, the, the catch-22 of all of these, of every possible activity. Um, but I think that, um, you know, think about it like, um, you know, the, the, I've had a various opinion, the very, various metaphors for this, but, you know, um, if you're a, if you're a, a technologist, um, imagine um, Elon Musk has created the first uh, autonomous Android and you need to teach it and raise it and, uh, you know, uh, feed it and it eats the same, like, what would you, how would you treat it? Like, if you're the one who's supposed to be training this thing to be, you know, to be a functioning uh, human-like entity, what things would you do? And like, oh, okay, well, if it's, if it's, if it's a, you know, biomechanical uh, entity that, um, you know, then I would treat it really well. Um, and God has entrusted you with a biomechanical machine that you get to, you know, work around with. And yeah, okay, machine, you know, body's not just a machine. And um, it's, you know, much more profound than that, but like at least treat it as well as you would, you know, a loaned robot from, you know, Tesla or whatever. Um, wouldn't that be, <laughs> would that be nice? Um, or um, a more maybe natural and human metaphor is, you know, imagine you're pregnant. Um, like what would you do? you know, and how would you take care of your body if you were responsible for another human being? It's like, well, good, like, I, 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 well, <laughs> like, um, and, you know, that doesn't mean you have to be a, you know, uh, uh, fitness uh, obsessed, but it does mean like, you know, pay a little more attention. Um, and and re recognize too, like, when you have more capacity, you can be more generous. This is also with, um, this is an argument about money too. Like a lot of you are gonna be rich. Um, and I know that's like, especially in this last year or two, this is like a painful realization. Um, but you know, what's the options? Well, to be guilty all the time or to, you know, if God gives you the ability to make money, then like make money and be generous. Um, so too with your physical health. You could be healthy and uh, you know, sleep well, you're gonna be less irritable. Um, and you know, if you're 
if you're physically healthy, you'll have more energy to do your problem sets and then be able to, you know, can take care of your friend who's, who's you know, having a hard time. Um, that the, the healthier we are, um, the, the better, but, you know, um, so too spiritually. Um, let's not neglect our spiritual, um, our spiritual health because, uh, you know, exercise uh, profits a little, um, as Paul says, but, um, you know, there's things that are uh, training in spiritual things are even more valuable.